All right. Uh, welcome. And thank you all for showing up to our WS Music Series. This one, it's a family affair. Um, my name is Howard Wooden. I'm a client service manager for, World, for WOS. And you're going to experience a great um, workshop today. Our title of our session today is Introduction to the History of Classical Music. Well, let me tell you a little bit about, no, that's not true. What is, what's today's, today's introduction to instruments of the orchestra? I'm sorry about that. Um, and if you think you know all the instruments in the orchestra, you do not. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, I thought I did. And I've learned something every time Eric and Jenny do this. So, but before we get started here, let me tell you a little bit about us. Uh, WS is an innovative nonprofit organization that operates in over 60 locations in the US alone. And we try to connect individuals from underserved populations with transformative career opportunities in all types of fields of work, from mechanics to Java developers and much more. We also have provide free training through our in the community initiatives and our latest one, the Workforce Essentials Workshop, the Ascent PDI, all kinds of things there, empowers individuals to move from entry-level positions to long-lasting professional success. Uh, these workshops are often three hours a day for four consecutive days. And if you're in interested or you know somebody that could benefit from it, let us know and we'll get in touch with them. It's really quite wonderful. We are, and just tonight, we have two of the instructors here. Today is the second of eight one-hour sessions. And we already have planning another session uh, that will start in April with the Harlem Needleworks folks and Needle Arts. And that is going to be a three-part series and you're gonna love that one. If you think you know about fabric arts and quilting and all kinds of things, there is a lot to learn from that session that will start in April about the history of quilts and its implication in our whole um, culture. It's really gonna be wonderful. Um, throughout this session, we'd love to have your participation. There'll be times that Eric and Jenny may ask you a question, but if not, hold on to your questions or ask them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end when we can have a discussion at that point. So if, because of that, please stay muted. And there will also be a handout that Eric and Jenny have provided that will go deeper into a lot of what you're going to hear tonight. If you wanna seek out other links, that handout will be given at the end also as well as a little survey that we will um, ask you to download and fill out as well. Um, that really helps us. That's one of the reasons why we can continue on with this. We learn a lot. So um, please you know, take advantage of both the handout and the, uh, the uh, survey as well. I appreciate that. But let's get started here. I don't wanna take up too much time and I wanna introduce our people. Um, I, we're gonna start with Jenny. There we go. Um, pianist Jenny Lin is an artist of keen musicianship, brilliant technique, and a compelling perspective shaped by a deep fluency in global culture. She was born in Taiwan, raised in Austria, and educated in Europe and America. Jenny has built a vibrant international career, notable for innovative collaborations with a range of artists and creators. She's performed with orchestras throughout the world, including the American Symphony Orchestra, the NDR and SWR German Radio Orchestras, the RAI National Symphony Orchestra, and others. She has performed at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, the Kennedy Center, at BAM Next Wave, Spoleto USA, and the Schleswig Holstein Festival, as well as a whole bunch of other places. That's Jenny Lin, and her partner pre presenter tonight is Eric Osner. He's Finnish American conductor with whose versatility as a conductor is stretched across a broad range of repertoire from conducting as few as five performers in contemporary and modern works to leading 300 performers across 19 different film concert pro projects, including the live in using the live in concert format. Just in 2017, Eric was invited to become principal touring conductor for La La Land Live in concert, which has taken him around the globe, performing the Academy Award and Grammy Award winning score of Justin Hurwitz. From Montreal to Melbourne and Moscow, from Stockholm to San Diego and Sofia, Bulgaria, audiences and critics alike have been praising Oxner's energy, attention to detail and precise synchronization 
We do the same here. We praise his energy and synchronization as well. And it's my pleasure to introduce both of them to get to tonight's workshop. Take it away, folks. Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Hi, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, it's great. Okay. Good. One of the fascinating things about this orchestral music world that, that uh, Jenny and I both play in is that no matter where we go around the world, even though sometimes we can't quite communicate in spoken language, we certainly do communicate using the musical language. Just fascinates me. So today, we want to talk about all the different sounds that you hear in the orchestra. So this is all about listening. I want you to keep your ears open, turn your volume up, and let's see if we can introduce you to some new things. A couple of base things, though, first. What is music? What do we consider music? It's something we can listen to, we can dance to, it definitely can make us happy or sad, it can make us laugh or cry, and music really does connect with people's emotions. So I have the first sound, I want you to close your eyes and think, what does this make you feel like? Does this make you feel any different? Now open your eyes, feel the room, feel the atmosphere, keep listening and see what this makes you feel like. Now something we experience when we go to a concert is the visual. So how does this make you feel? It can make you happy, sad, laugh, cry. I hope all of that came with those excerpts. But before we get into any more audio or visual samples, Let's talk a little bit about the eight elements of music. Jenny, do you want to help me out here? Let's start with dynamics. Dynamics means how loud or soft the music is. And then form. Form can be the order and arrangement of the parts of music. And you have harmony. Harmony is how the instruments support the melody with chords below it, or sometimes above it. And melody? Melody, there's a good word. We're gonna be talking about some melody as a young lady with Jenny's project coming up soon. But melody in this case in music means the series of pitches that makes a tune. Rhythm. How long or short the sound is. Texture the layers of sound, how sparse or dense music can be. Timber. The unique sound quality of an instrument or sound, which we're really gonna focus on in this, listening to the variety of instruments that we focus on today. And then tonality. The overall sound of the music. It's a little subjective to say as pleasant or unpleasant, but I really think that the audiences should develop a feeling. Do you like something or not? It's not always nice just to get a standing ovation because that's what we do every time after every concert. Make a, make a judgment. You don't have to like everything you hear. So symbols and Italian terms are used to describe how a piece of music should be played. Most of the scores that we read will have all of these terms helping us understand the composer's intentions in Italian. So from the top, we have crescendo, meaning becoming louder. Fortissimo, very loud. Forte, not so loud. Mezzo forte, moderately loud. Mezzo piano, moderately soft. Piano, pianissimo, diminuendo. So this is part of what I do as a conductor. My left hand will be acting a little bit like this volume button slider or fader that you have on the uh, left side there. So what instrument? was invented in 1700. Does anyone have an answer? I give you a hint. It has a few keys, 88 of them, and Jenny Lin plays it. Now, because we're in COVID, because we're doing this, 
all in remote parts of the world, we have a video for you. Jenny, do you want to say anything about it or maybe speak afterwards? Maybe afterwards. Okay, here we go. Hello, everybody. My name is Jenny Lin. I'm a classical concert pianist. I became a concert pianist because when I was a little girl, my mother took me to this really big and beautiful concert hall. And on stage, there was this big, big grand piano and out came a beautiful lady in a beautiful evening gown. And when she sat down, she played this gorgeous piece by the Polish French composer, Frederick Chopin. It was so beautiful that it was such a memorable evening that I told my mother later on that I would like to become a pianist. I love the piano very much because the piano, I think, is the most important of all the instruments. Not only can you play as a soloist alone, you can also play the piano with a cello player or a violin player, or you can play with a string quartet, and that's four people. You can even play with a jazz band or even an entire symphony orchestra of a hundred people. So the piano makes beautiful sound and you can play any song you want on the piano from jazz to classical to pop. And it's just such a versatile instrument that I think for me, piano is the most important instrument of all the instruments. So let me tell you a little bit more about the piano. There are many different types of piano, but there are two main kinds. One is called an upright piano, which you probably have seen in your school or at home. It's a large box and you put it against the wall and sometimes you can even open and see all the strings inside. But then the more popular kind is the grand piano. And here you have a baby grand piano. Now this grand piano is the smallest size of all the grand pianos, but doesn't mean that it's not powerful. It's just as beautiful as all the other pianos. Let's have a mini tour of this baby grand piano. First, Let's look at the most important part of the piano are the 88 keys. There are black keys as well as white keys. And then here you have high notes. And then here you have the low notes. All of this is separated by the most important middle C. Underneath the keyboard, you have pedals. This baby grand piano has only two pedals. The right pedal sustains the sound and holds the sound for a very long time when you want to. And the left pedal actually makes the sound softer. So you can really change the different colors. And when I open the front cover, inside there is the music stand. When you put the music stand up, you can put whatever song that you're working on and practicing right up here. And then the main cover, sometimes you will need a little help when you open it. You can see all the incredible things inside the piano. You have strings for the high notes here in the middle and here are the low strings. As you can see, the low strings have the low sounds and the high strings have the high sounds. And all of these strings are connected to the hammers and the dampers, which makes up this entire thing called the piano action. So as a treat, I would love to show off this beautiful piano for you and play the famous Chop Waltz, but you might know this song as Chopsticks.
You make that so much fun. You make it look so easy, Jenny. <laughs> so this is like a little, I guess, teaser for one of my sessions about the piano in a couple of weeks. And um, just to introduce the piano um, and to look inside, which I, I'm sure a lot of people don't realize how many parts there are. I think last time I asked a Steinway, a typical Steinway grand piano has about something like 10,000 parts wow. at least. Um, and then most of it are handmade. So it takes really a long time to build a piano. And one thing I wanted to say about, you talked about the soft pedal and the way that the soft pedal works, someone asked me is that most of the strings in the piano actually have three strings on the inside. Some of them have fewer, but the soft pedal actually is able to take the mechanism and move it over. So it only hits two strings. So that's exactly. automatically softer. It's really cool. Yes. yes. It's, it's a really high tech, to be honest. I mean, that they invented this, you know, 300 years ago. And the people that were involved were definitely very advanced engineers. And not to cut you off, but we have a whole session coming up about called The Piano Story, which uh, Jenny is going to share with us the history and talk about composers and pieces. We also have a session coming up next week, and we have a little video for that. So let's take a listen to this. Jenny has written a book. Now, without further ado, we're going to keep moving on because this is a real Zoom, a real race to get to the finish today. I want to talk about creating sounds. So painters use colors, but composers use the symphony orchestra. Ta-da! So this whole group of instruments comes together as the symphony orchestra. Let's go through and start meeting some of these instruments. So Jenny can help me out. What instruments play in the symphony orchestra? We have the strings and then the woodwinds, the brass, and percussion. And now we're going to go through and meet each instrument, actually quite a few instruments from every single family of here. So in the strings, we have... Let's start with the violin. Violin, viola, cello, and the bass. I got to go to this screen. And let's start with the violin here. So uh, this is a friend of mine who I grew up playing uh, with the Indianapolis Youth Symphony. This is Derek. Hey, Eric, this is a violin. And of course, this, this day and age, we don't only have classical music, but we also have a little bit of jazz, a little bit of bluegrass, a little bit of rock. So this is my friend, Denny. Hi, Eric. Here's a little fiddle tune for you. Thanks, Denny. So these are all a whole bunch of my friends that I reached out and said, can you help me with a music class where I'm trying to talk about sounds and introducing instruments? So the next one we have is called the viola. It's a little bit bigger than the violin, but still played with the same way. This is my friend Remy. He's French Canadian, plays in the Toronto Symphony. Hi, Eric. This is my viola. And I'm going to play Jean du Pays by Gilles Vigneault. Uh, it's considered the Quebec national anthem, but many people sing it in birthdays because it's a beautiful love song. <laughs> Nice. 
nice. The next, uh, for the cello, I decided to get two celebrities. So the first one uh, became famous due to the royal wedding, and his name is Sheku Kene Mason. I should have mentioned still a string instrument, obviously. It gets a little bit bigger and a little bit lower and then is then played in a different position. Now there's a crazy guy who I worked with once named Yo-Yo Ma. I hope many of you know his name. He's considered the best cellist or certainly the most famous. Um, and he's been celebrated for working all across borders in terms of different types of music, different people, different places. He has an ensemble called the Silk Road Ensemble. And here he's working with a young street dancer named Lil Buck with a famous piece of music. So amazing, that's the Saint-Saëns, the swan from Carnival the Animals. And I, like I said, he's just totally cross borders. Now I have a friend of mine named Troy. He's gonna tell us about the double bass, a much larger instrument. And those of you who've ever been in New York sometimes see them being rolled around in the subway system. It's quite an instrument to carry. Hi, Eric. <laughs> So that's a little piece from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony for anyone who recognized that, the fourth movement. And now there's a guy who I've met through Instagram who gave me permission to use this. This is Alex playing a little bit different timbre or tone of the double bass. You may see that finger shaking a little bit. That's referred to as vibrato or to vibrate. Many instruments use it and it's up to the player to decide really how much to vibrate the sound before or after. So that's another term for you to learn. Now I just wanted to play a couple of fun little pieces to show a variety of how uh, music affects people of all ages and all backgrounds. So here is a young little guy from Melbourne, Australia. He's 10 years old and he's playing Vivaldi Four Seasons, and this just blows me away every time I watch it. So look at this little guy. He's conducting the orchestra and playing the solo part. Here you go. Oh, sorry, I put him in the wrong order. This is a, a Latin piece for string quartet. Let me see if I can back up. Sorry about that. Oh, hang on, hang on, my mistake. There we go. So that's uh, just a fantastic thing called the Harlem String Quartet that's able to play uh, a piece called Pan Con Timba. Now I'm a little confused by my own PowerPoint here. Let me see what the next piece is going to be. There we go. That's, the whole piece is about 30 minutes long, and when I've watched it, it's really just totally affects your emotions. You can't escape having goosebumps and tears, and this guy is just in the zone. Just, um, what, what can you say? Or what we said last week was where words leave off, music begins. So amazing. Now, there's another technique in addition to vibrato that's called pizzicato, and it means to literally pick the sound or pick the string. And this is a piece that I just thought was so incredible. A violinist named Christian Lin gave me permission to use this. So listen to all of the sounds that he's making, but particularly pay attention to the left hand, which is over here. 
because normally you would pizzicato with your right hand after bowing, but this is doing both. And it sounds like there are four people playing. If you haven't started playing by now, you're never going to be able to achieve that. I can't either, but what? Oh my God, just blew me away. So talk about some virtuoso playing. Okay, we are saying goodbye to the string family, and we are going to come to the woodwind family. Jenny, help me out here. Oh, Jenny's still on mute. Flute and piccolo, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. Fantastic. Thank you. So now we're going to go into these woodwind families and meet individual instruments. The first one we have. Hi, Eric. Thank you for inviting me to play for your talk. This is the flute. So this is a piece of the French composer Claude Debussy called Syrinx, and it's written for solo flute. And thank you to my friend Siren. She's actually one of the top flute players in the entire world. You just got to hear her play. She plays the second flute in the famous Cleveland Orchestra. So the little cousin of the, of the flute, which is quite a bit higher, is called the piccolo. And one of the most famous pieces of, for the piccolo solo is in a piece called Stars and Stripes Forever. Perhaps you've heard this solo. But what happens if you're playing this concert at something called the National Flute Association, where there might just be a whole bunch of people that also play the flute? Quite a celebration there with no fewer than 94 piccolos playing together. And trust me, it's a very hard instrument to keep in tune. So I'm quite impressed by that recording. I think that was done down in Dallas. So we move on to an instrument called the oboe and the English horn. One of my dearest friends who I grew up playing in the Indianapolis Youth Symphony. This is my friend Pam. She's going to introduce both the oboe and the English horn. Hi, everyone. My name is Pam Iango. Hi, Maestro Eric. I play the oboe in the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra. The oboe is a woodwind instrument seen here. I'm going to just play a few seconds of it for you so that you can hear what it sounds like. I hope you like it. So you'll notice that the oboe is actually called a double reed instrument. So there are two pieces of reed or cane that are put together, and then she has to use a knife and all these things to carve it to work well, and then she has the, the reed in her mouth. Now the lower cousin of the oboe is called the English horn. English horn has a similar range and color to what we heard the cello, but here's Pam introducing the English horn. Hi everyone, this is Pam. 
I'm back with the bigger oboe, which is also known as the English horn. The English horn has some of the most beautiful melodies in all of orchestral repertoire. I'm going to play one of them for you, and I think you might actually recognize it. You might have heard it last week, too. So that's from Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, and that's called the second movement, the Largo, or called Going Home. Someone put some words to it. We're going to move on to the clarinet, which is next. Hi, Eric. That's my friend Enid. Notice the clarinet. Well, you can't quite see the mouthpiece, but it only has a single reed. So the clarinet and the saxophones all have single reed. And now we're going to next hear uh, a clip that I found on YouTube that I thought was so uh, energetic and fun. Could we play jazz? Could we play blues on the clarinet? So this is uh, Evan Christopher. Check this out. just makes you smile, you wanna bop along. Next, we have an instrument called the alto sax that is famous both in the classical world and the jazz world. Let's hear a little bit of classical sound first from my friend Heidi. Hello, Eric. This is the alto saxophone, and here is an excerpt in the classical style. <laughs> international friends coming in. This is Ryoichi, who I met while on tour in Japan, also playing alto saxophone. Hi, Eric. I'm Ryoichi from Japan. This is alto saxophone. <laughs> That's the show and tell part. I like that. <laughs> I didn't ask him to do that. I just thought it was so funny. Next, we have a friend of mine named Fivos, Fivos from Greece, who I worked with on La La Land 2. He's a tenor saxophone player and listen to his sound. Hi, Eric. This is tenor saxophone. <laughs> come back to another double reed instrument called the bassoon. This is my friend Mark who plays in an Indianapolis symphony. Hi Eric and class. I'm Mark Ortwine. I play bassoon in the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. Uh, the bassoon is a double reed instrument. It's pretty complicated at first. There's a lot of thumb work. These are all my thumbs, my two thumbs. <laughs> I have to hit all these keys and then there's the front. The bassoon has a pretty big range. It's a three and a half octaves. The 
defend. And Mark is so creative. He's played the Star Spangled Banner for the Indianapolis Colts on Amplified Bassoon and all sorts of other things that he's done. But how about when you need a little help from your friends? the world has ever heard of a bassoon choir but they exist and i have just proven their existence <laughs> so that is our quick whirlwind tour zoom tour we zoomed through the woodwinds and next if jenny can help me with the brass instruments yes let's go to the brass section my favorite french horn trumpet trombone and the tuba okay now we're going to go hear some clips the first brass instrument we're going to hear is the french horn <laughs> Okay, next we have the trumpet. This is a friend of mine named Chris who also plays. Many of these people who are uh, around New York City play in my Sonos Chamber Orchestra here. And so Chris also gave us a little excerpt. So here is Chris. I hope it shows my passion about this whole symphony orchestra, classical, but not always classical stuff. So here's something called the Bugler's Holiday, which gets performed normally on Pops concerts and things like that, uh, written by uh, Anderson. And here is more than just three trumpets playing. Check this out. One, two, one, two. <laughs> From my experience, I can tell you that's a pretty quick clip. So it really requires that level of professional trumpet player to be able to play that. Next, we have the trombone. So this is famous for having this long slide and that's how you change the sound. And I wanted to show you something that it can be a very mellow and rich sound first in this classical piece. So listen to this version of this sound from the trombone. I think that's, it sound, feels so mournful to me. That was magnum, magnum mysterium. But 76 trombones is also a pretty famous number. You might've heard this from the music man. Here's a little clip from the film to remind you. <laughs> So we, I'm going to talk a little bit about marching bands coming up too. So marching band is something that seems to be a strictly an American phenomenon and has become quite popular. But recently working in Taiwan, uh, there was even a small marching band that they're starting over there. Next is the lowest instrument in the brass section, the tuba. And this is a friend of mine, DeAndre, playing a little piece for us. Hi, Eric. <laughs> Quite a range there. Now, a couple of ensemble pieces that I would like you to hear. The first one is written originally by Mozart, but here arranged for it called the Ten Thing Brass Ensemble. Thank you. 
So I know many brass players who happen to be women, so don't be surprised by it, but I wanted to make sure and include that. And now talking about the numbers of brass players that you could have on stage in a symphony orchestra, if you look at this graphic, maybe four trumpets, three trombones, usually four French horns and one tuba. But in the American uh, uh, marching band, this is a video from uh, HBCU, Historically Black uh, College University, uh, Southern University at the National Battle of the Bands. I give you 215 brass players in a piece by a little mass called Industry Baby. I love how they they're moving not only with the beat, but you could also see them breathing. I just, I cannot fathom what type of volume that must be for any of the players who are involved with that. Okay, we have met the brass instruments. Next, we are going to go into the percussion. Jenny, who do we have in the percussion section as an example? We have timpani, snare drums, bass drums, basically the whole family of drums, cymbals, xylophone, vibraphone, harp, piano. This is interesting that piano is a percussion instrument. There are so many instruments in the percussion family that it's very hard to go through all of them. My favorite yeah, I, is the, tri the triangle. Oh, the triangle, nice. Okay, well, last week we talked about a piece that I did called Pixar in Concert and we had 66 different instruments in the percussion section. So the first one we're gonna meet here, not typically thought of as a percussion instrument, but it does fall into the family, is this little guy over here. This is my friend Estelle, I've known a long time, a French harp player. She will introduce you to the harp. Bonjour, Eric. <laughs> oftentimes related to those sounds of the angels, as one might imagine, from the harp. Next, we have the timpani or the kettle drums that normally sit in the back of the orchestra. And here is an interesting uh, percussion video that I found that just play, shows the percussion section playing during a rehearsal of percussion only. And you're going to hear it with just the percussion. And then you'll hear it with the percussion and the orchestra together. This comes from Germany. There's the triangle. I'm going to skip forward a little bit because I'm looking at the time a little bit short. So you notice that there's not much melody going on in there. Not many of the percussion instruments have a pitch that they can play, but listen to how it fits in. Okay, next we have just, I'm gonna cut a little bit of this excerpt. This was a piece that I conducted in Taiwan. This is me conducting. Uh, and we used a marching band on the stage with the symphony orchestra.
pretty loud, pretty loud. The, or the orchestra was very cooperative, but it certainly got the blood flowing for that. That was from uh, Monsters University. So those are my two friends, Haruka and Rika Fuji, their sisters, marimba players. That's the sound of the marimba. And they worked with a composer who also is a videographer, and they created that really super cool modern uh, music video. And I just think it's fascinating how they use graphics and, and uh, the, the music there. Next is a friend of mine uh, named Annette, and she's going to show us the conga drums. Yes, and I am a percussionist. <laughs> This is my friend Shane. He's also worked with Yo-Yo Ma before. We worked together. And this is a piece written for hand drum. Keep an eye, if you can, on the lower left foot, because he starts to play even some uh, instruments there. And see if you can count what uh, rhythm he's in. Is he playing in two beats, four beats, five beats, seven beats? I love that clip. Here's my friend Troy introducing us to a pretty common instrument that you will recognize. So we have both the uh, traditional rock drum set, but also the electric guitar. And this is Troy's band out in Los Angeles that's called Garlic Butter. There we go. Let me get out of this clip for a second. Hang on a second. Oh, I have to go back to here. Sorry. Hi, Dave. Hang on one second. Hang on one second. Ah, disaster. Hang on one second. Hang on. I need to do, I have too many screens going here. Sorry, guys. Let me do this. Let me swap this. There we go. OK, so I need to get through this. Too many things layered on one page, so I have to get through this. Sorry for my technical ineptitude here. I got to finish this. That's what gets me when I try to skip through things. Let me see what's going to happen next. We already saw this one. I forward through the end of that. Yes. We met I... Annette already. We met Shane already. I'm trying to get to my friend Andrew, who's going to play some guitar for us. Here we go. My friend Andrew Dickinson, a piece of music that he wrote, in fact. So there are other friends that we work with. We also work with the accordion. We work with the organ. But I want to um, inspire you to come next week. There are other friends that we have. The accordion. That's my accordion Hello, friend. Hello, my name is Guy, and this instrument that I'm holding here is... Yeah. I'm running short on time today because I didn't prepare, sorry. So this is organ then. You've all heard this piece. So the famous piece of Bach called Toccata and Fugue. There are just so many things I want to be able to share with you. Then we also have a small clip that I'm going to skip right now, Jenny, uh, which is talking about Melody's Mostly Musical Day, which is happening next week, same place, uh, 5 p.m. Written and performed by Jenny. 
And I want to encourage all of you before we get into Q&A, not to be afraid of something you don't know. So whether it's jazz music, whether it's marching band, whether it's classical, whether it's opera, we're going to talk about opera, but music can really give you goosebumps and tears and it can move you. Here are four excerpts that I hope move you. That's the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra. Look at the energy and excitement and pleasure that they all get in playing. And uh, two pieces that I want to just sort of uh, amaze you by the finger work. This is my friend Jackie playing some music of Paganini. Watch the fingers. <laughs> one I just found last night. So a, a Russian pianist named Dmitry Shishkin playing Liszt's Mephisto Waltz. Again, just look at the fingers, look at the arms. I don't know how it's humanly possible. Jenny will have to explain it because I can't. And I've talked about music giving you goosebumps and tears, and don't forget, it can also cause fireworks. So I hope you have enjoyed this whirlwind zoom through the introduction to instruments of the orchestra. I just wanted you to hear so many different things and experience new sounds and timbres and colors. And there we are. Who has a question? Who would like to comment on anything? The floor is yours. Or Jenny, do you want to add anything? No, it's that was great. I enjoyed it. I, just so amazing to see all the musicians taping don't, little excerpts. Don't be shy out there, folks. Step right up, ask a question. I think it's great with the technology we have, all the musicians can tape little video excerpts of themselves and share it. And that's just amazing. And to also hear those, so many instruments just by themselves. If yeah. you go to a symphony orchestra concert, you hear all those instruments together. One of the questions in the chat, uh, Eric, is what is your favorite instrument? Oh, Lordy. <laughs> Jenny Lynn is present. So I will say my favorite instrument is the piano. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, I, I will admit I have a, a soft spot for the emotional value uh, that I get from uh, the response that I get from the English horn and the cello. I think mm. that can be incredibly moving. There's another question. Why isn't saxophone part of an orchestra, Eric? Oh, sorry. Now I see the chat window. It's on a different place. Um, yeah. Believe it or not, uh, the saxophone is part of some pieces. Debussy used the, the uh, saxophone in symphony orchestra. And then if you get uh, uh, Ravel did as well, I believe. And then there are some pieces later that we have jazz composers and look at uh, Hollywood film composers. We're going to talk, um, I forget what day it is now, but the, one of our sessions is about film music. And there is such a yeah. huge combination um, of j jazz instruments coming into Hollywood film scores. The, another reason the saxophone was not invented till a little bit later. So a lot of the repertoire that symphony orchestras have in the classical or romantic period 
the composer just didn't have access to that instrument. Excellent point. Another great um, question there. Stephen is asking, what's the difference between a philharmonic? So phil, phil uh, meaning love, lover of sounds, philharmonic, symphony orchestra, there's no, there's no difference. It's just a semantic uh, different word used. It can be, if you talk about a chamber orchestra, that would mean more a smaller group of people that traditionally could fit in a room for like a private performance, camera music, musique de chambre, as they would call it. Uh, that's really the only difference. I think, and if you, um, if you look at their text, oh. okay. Uh, orchestras with an older history usually uses philharmonic. It's a more traditional term. Um, also depends on the board members and the people who, you know, fund the organization, they have naming rights. Sometimes they feel philharmonic sounds better. And usually there's a much bigger association or organization present when you have a philharmonic. Symphony orchestras are usually newer, younger, and um, with a smaller organization behind it. Good point. And if you look at their tax papers, some of them have all of those words in, in the title. I used to be assistant conductor for the Brooklyn Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra, Inc. They just threw them all in there. <laughs> Good question. Is There's the a question. Recorder, yeah, recorder ever used professionally? Uh, so the recorder is a, a much older instrument and it is, uh, has been written for, for example, by Vivaldi. So sometimes we do hear concertos written for recorder and orchestra. Uh, there are some composers, again, going back to Hollywood film scores. So when I was conducting uh, a film score to Inside Out, by the composer Michael Giacchino, it used recorders. So we have them, we put them on stage. There's an older version of the recorder that gets used um, a lot more in older music, like Baroque music, Renaissance music, you do find the recorder. Recorder is just a little bit more limited in terms of the range of sound that it can um, make. So composers feel limited when they use it's all about the composers, you know, like Eric would talk about composers, I'm sure much later on too, that whatever is available to them, they use. And in German, actually, the word flute is used for both the transverse flute or querflöte or the recorder called the blockflöte. So they use flöte for both in that case. Anyone else? Oh, have we done the handouts yet? Handouts and surveys. Well, I was just about to say in your chat, folks, don't forget that the handout is there. Maybe um, Eric or Jenny, you want to tell people a little bit about what the handout is, what they can find there? So it's it's just sort of a summary, a lot of uh, the music interest stuff here. I'm not really able to publicly share all of those videos necessarily from my friends, but there are a couple of links down at the bottom of that handout. One which I found really fascinating from the Portland Youth Orchestra, where they were having a similar talk like this, but what the conductor asked all the different sections of the orchestra to prepare their own excerpts to introduce their instrument to the audience. And it's a wide variety. You get Ghostbusters, you get Frozen, you get all sorts of different tunes. So feel free to listen to that. And Jenny, and both... what, what, tell us what's coming up next week. So um, Eric had mentioned it earlier that I have a book and the book is connected to a recording. So it's a musical book with illustrations. And um, I actually made a concert out of the story. And so I'm going to have that little concert here pre-recorded in my basement to share with you. But also um, it's definitely very family friendly. And um, just to see how music can be applied to education and to children and children as old and as, you know, 10 and as young as 80. So what was the inspiration? Yeah. I'm sorry, Jenny, what, what was your inspiration for creating this? Um, I've always felt education was important. Um, I was a little tired of the things that you find at Starbucks, you know, Mozart for babies, Bach for babies. And I really wanted to have a more creative project that really took music to a higher step <coughs> for kids related that they can relate to. I, I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be great. 
And at least one of my friends who's on this call, their granddaughter has seen this and really loves it. So if you have family members who have young ones, grandchildren, your children, uh, it's a really wonderful, wonderful story. Melody's Mostly Musical Day. What else? So Jenny, who else? Jenny, Jenny, would you share with us how, where we can get this book? I have several grandchildren who are very interested in, in music and they would probably love this. Yeah, so um, at yeah. one point, this is released by Steinway. At one point, it was available on Amazon and somehow the Steinway store is no longer there for this book, but sometimes you might be able to find it um, um, on like eBay or something, but you know, I have some, I will be happy to send them to you. I can talk to Ho Howard if you want it to maybe get a list of people who might want it. We can definitely share it with whoever is interested. Um, you might find some on eBay and Amazon individuals are selling them, or we can write to Steinway directly. I can help you with that too. Well, let's say we'll try to figure this out for next week. Please come next week and we'll we'll, yes. we'll see if we can get all of the connections that we can. Um, and we'll make sure um, that if you want one, we're going to get make sure you get one. Sounds good. Well, I really appreciate both of you. I cannot wait. We've set ourselves up last week. We got a little bit of history of, of uh, classical music today. Today we've gotten the instruments. Jenny's gonna lead us a little bit more about how things are developed and how we can educate the, our you know, people to start into this. It's, this is a wonderful series. I hope everyone comes back next week and continue to invite someone, bring, some, bring a friend. I know some of you have one or more people in watching with you. So um, keep spreading the word. This has been fantastic. And unless someone has a burning question, we're gonna say good night and everybody can have, um, you can go off and drink your tea or whatever, have dinner, or if you're from a part of the country that you're not ready for that yet, you can uh, figure that one out as well. So thanks. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thanks, yes. Eric. See you next week. Thank you, everybody. Feel free to email me. The email address is eeoxner at gmail.com. It's also in the handout.